Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi uh, brother and sister. Uh, Alhamdulillah, uh, this is our second topic okay, for this uh, course, uh, Legal Framework and Issues in Islamic Banking and Finance, or IBF 7316. <coughs> okay, so brother and sisters, this is our second topic. Okay, It is about uh, crafting legal landscape, essential legislation for Islamic Banking and Finance. Okay, so brother and sister, if you still remember, as I mentioned, uh, when we understand uh, the legal framework or the regulatory structures, okay, uh, for Islamic banking and finance, okay, it is basically uh, it's just like holding a map, okay, where basically if you encounter any kind of issues or problem, okay, you can come back and refer to the map. Okay, so now by the sisters, okay, today we're going to look at okay, uh, in much more closer, okay, basically relating to the important legislations or the regulation, which basically uh, craft or basically uh, influence, okay, uh, the operation, okay, of Islamic banking and finance, okay, and then of course, we're going to take a few examples, okay, uh, from other countries, okay, in, including of course Malaysia, okay. <clears throat> so brothers and sisters, okay, um, this is a statement, okay. This is a statement by Prof. Kurabia, okay, uh, in two thousand eight, okay. So basically, what he mentions, what she mentioned here, okay, um, basically, okay, the legal and regulatory framework is very important, okay, especially you know, uh, for uh, the establishment okay, for the establishment of Islamic banking and finance. Okay. And then when it comes to this legal and regulatory framework, okay, it, it is basically uh, received influence okay, from the local history, local politics, and of course, local social economic circumstances. Okay. And then this is why, by the ancestor, okay, we can see uh, the different uh, development okay, from one country to another country around the world. Okay, especially when it comes to Islamic banking and finance. Okay, so right now, brothers and sister, okay, this is an overview. Okay, a little brief. Okay, on our, on what what going we going to discuss here. Okay, so basically the development of Islamic banking and finance industry in Malaysia. Okay, uh, it is basically again depends on the legal framework. Okay, and then this legal framework, the regulatory structures, basically, uh, is crafted. Okay, by referring okay by the establishment or the issuance of certain statute or acts or uh, the regulations okay <clears throat> and then these regulations basically have to go through the democratic process okay under the Malaysian Parliament okay this is basically uh, okay uh, depends on the process of federalism okay which is applicable in Malaysia okay and then not just that. Okay, uh, when come to this uh, legal landscape, okay, when come to this legal uh, legal framework by the ancestor in Malaysia again, okay, we have uh, the 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 regulatory laws, okay, or the enabling acts, okay, and then we have other uh, other types of uh, transactional uh, laws, okay, <clears throat> so. Basically, by the ancestors, okay, as you can see from the slide, okay, uh, this uh, legislation okay, basically can be divided into main statutes, okay, which is basically covers the regulatory laws, okay, the important laws, okay, which give birth to the is making finance industry in Asia. And then we have other relevant statutes, okay, which is basically fall under the categories of transactional laws. Okay. Uh, but then, of course, okay. Uh, actually, when it come to the process in court, okay, especially when there, when there is no emergent of dispute, okay, we have basically uh, the third category of the laws, which is known as the procedure laws, okay. But then, for the purpose of our discussion here, we're going to look at okay, uh, the enabling laws, okay, or the regulatory laws, okay. And then we want to also uh, going to look at the uh, the transactional laws, okay, or the other relevant statutes or acts which is which are applicable, okay, for the economic and finance operations, okay. <clears throat> so brothers and sisters, again, uh, this is the figure, okay. This is the summary, okay, for the Islamic financial system in Malaysia, 
Okay, as I mentioned, usually uh, the takaful, okay, takaful sector usually been, uh, you know, been discussed together with the Islamic banking and finance. Okay, and then we have another sector which is known as Islamic capital market. Okay, when it comes to Islamic capital market, we have other uh, main regulator which is Security Commission of Malaysia. Okay, and then for the Islamic capital market, they have their own. Okay, they have their own main statutes, they have their own uh, regulatory laws or the enabling laws. Okay, when it comes to its market and finance and takaful, okay, uh, the main regulator is the Central Bank of Malaysia or Bank Negara Malaysia. Okay, and then brother and sisters, these are the main uh, regulatory laws for this sector. Okay, first of all, we have the Central Bank of Malaysia Act 2009 <coughs> or in short CBMA 2009. Okay. And then we have uh, Islamic Finance Services Act 2013. Okay, this is basically enforceable towards all Islamic financial services institutions. Okay, and then we have uh, you know Financial Services Act 2013, which is basically applicable for conventional banking systems. Okay, <clears throat> and then of course, uh, as we already discussed, the most important thing when we have okay uh, these two separate legislations governing the two separate uh, in industries, okay, we can see that okay, the most important impact of having these two laws, uh, it shows that basically in Malaysia, we are applying okay, uh, dual banking systems, uh, which is parallel level with each other. Okay? And then we have the, sorry, we, and then we, of course we have the Development Financial Institution Act 2002, which is applicable for the development financial institutions or the or the development banks okay and then we have higher purchase act 1967 okay <clears throat> now let's us continue with our discussion in details okay <clears throat> again mother and sisters okay uh, it is most important when it come to market and finance okay we need to have we need to uphold the sharia compliant natures okay this is including okay, the prohibitions, okay, the, the prohibition of riba, maizir, okay, and warar, okay, in their operation, okay, and then of course, okay, it is important to note that, okay, the principles of Sharia, okay, basically may be similar or totally different, okay, from the existing laws as practiced in Malaysia, okay, and thus, okay, it is very important, okay, it is very important to ensure conformity, okay. Uh, between the applied laws and the theoretical aspect of Islamic and finance. Okay, so for the purpose of having this, you know, uh, conformity with the laws, okay, which is basically, you know, in order to avoid any kind of contradiction between the application of Sharia and the existing laws in Malaysia. Okay, basically what happened, the Central Bank of Malaysia, they established <coughs> They established the Law Harmonization Committee, which is basically uh, led by the former federal court judges and other relevant personnel. Okay, and then not just that. Okay, this committee of um, law harmonization. Okay, basically they have a wide experience in legal and Sharia practices. Okay, and then their establishment is specifically okay to avoid any existence of conflict of laws. Okay, that may cause any kind of legal issues, okay, uh, in the practice and operation of is market finance in Asia, okay. Uh, by the way, basically, why why it is important to avoid this kind of conflicts, okay, between the Sharia principles and the existing laws, okay. Basically, the existence of conflict, okay, can cause improper implementation of is market and finance system, okay, and then of course it also can lead poor compliance with Sharia principles. Okay, and then sometimes, okay, if you don't take care of this uh, conflict, okay, it can lead to the existence of Sharia non-compliant risk, okay, such as the, the existence of riba war and maizir, okay. At the same time, we need to avoid this kind of conflicts because it can also uh, it can also lead the Islamic banks or the Islamic financial services institution towards reputational risk, okay. So we cannot say that you know if the if the Islamic banks has this element of uh, riba, for example, interest, okay, 
so we cannot see that okay we we cannot say that you no know, it is purely 100% islamic banks okay so this can portray the reputational risk okay towards the bank okay this this is so this is important to have you know to have a proper uh, conformity okay between the sharia and the existing laws okay and then of course the okay, conflict in regulatory framework also can we can can lead towards okay weak weak operational system and then of course weak management structure okay inside the operation of the Islamic bank itself okay so this is important okay, to avoid this kind of conflict okay so again i i repeat okay when it comes to the operation of Islamic banking and finance uh, we have to uphold okay, the principles the application of uh, sharia principles okay and then at the same time we have to appreciate okay the existing laws of the country okay so right now okay uh, it is also important okay, to make sure that these laws are not conflicting with each other okay and then it is basically when we have this kind of conformity or consistency okay between uh, these uh, two set of laws okay basically we can avoid okay, the emergence of conflict when the inside the system itself okay <clears throat> so mother and sister okay this is a little bit on the ha law harmonization committee okay and then of course you can go and click <clears throat> this link okay which will lead you to the website okay uh, uh which is you no know, um you can find more information in this website okay <clears throat> when it comes to the law harmonization committee basically uh it is create it is basically been established okay, to create a conducive legal system that facilitates and support the development of Islamic finance industry. Uh, secondly, to achieve certainty and enforceability in the Malaysian laws in regard to Islamic finance contracts. Thirdly, to position Malaysia as the reference as the reference law for international Islamic finance finance transaction. And then, of course, uh, to make okay, uh, to make sure that the Malaysian law <coughs> to be you know the law of choice and the forum for settlement of dispute okay for cross-border islamic financial transactions okay and then alhamdulillah brother and sister i would like to inform you okay so far the law harmonization committee basically they are very successful okay, in their uh, in their process okay, in their <coughs> in their roles okay to harmonize the laws in malaysia specifically uh, so you can see yeah, even their report okay the last report okay uh, <coughs> the latest report okay basically you can find uh been issued okay by the law harmonization committee it is basically um, dated back uh, up to okay, 2013 okay <coughs> so basically you know um especially after the introduction of uh, islamic financial services act or ifsa 2013 we can say that almost yeah, almost every single uh, conflict of laws yeah, uh, between Sharia and the existing laws uh, basically uh, successfully okay, been eliminated. Okay, so far there is no issues. Okay, no further issues when it comes to the uh, harmonization uh, processes. Okay, <clears throat> so this is important. This is another reason to see how important is IPSA 2013. Okay, so brothers and sisters, okay, as I mentioned earlier on, okay, uh, we have two set, okay, two set of important legislation which is important, uh, to, uh, which is basically uh, been used okay, inside the Islamic finance industry, okay, and then <clears throat> when it come to the main statutes, they are the enabling or the reg the regulatory laws, okay. And then when it comes to other relevant statutes, okay, basically they are the much more letting related to transactional laws. Okay. So when it comes to the main statute, okay, uh, basically these are the accession laws that must be followed by the stakeholders of Islamic market finance. Okay. And then basically we can say the this legislation, these statutes, okay, can be said as the main statutes which give birth, okay. To the Islamic banking finance in Asia generally, okay, and then of course, <clears throat> okay, uh, it is important to follow these laws because uh, 
uh, okay, because it is basically, you know, uh, capturing okay, the nature of asset market and finance in Asia in their provisions. Okay, and then not just that, <coughs> but the assistors, okay, we can say that, okay, uh, in the case of failure to, fo to follow the laws, okay, for, to follow these enabling laws, okay, we can say that uh, the Sharia compliant nature uh, can be lost, okay, in the oppression, okay. And then not, not just that, <coughs> when it comes to the other level laws or the statutes, okay, we, this is basically <coughs> much more relating to the transactional laws. And then, of course, okay, and then, of course, okay, it is uh, much more uh, relevant okay, towards the operation of the ISM banks. Okay, so here we can see the from the examples. Okay, uh, let's say we have a customer okay, who want to build a house on a piece of land. Okay, so basically, uh, the land, okay, the land which is owned by the customer can be used as a security for financing the building of the house. Okay, so right now, when it comes uh, to the issue of making the land as security, uh, the most relevant laws that we can refer to is the National Land Code 1965. Okay, the National Land Code 1965 is basically the transactional laws which is important okay, towards land matters. Okay, it is basically not okay, the enabling laws or the regulatory laws, okay, which is um, which basically give birth okay, to the in the Eastern market and finance. Okay, so this uh, is this is other different okay, between the uh, the main statute or the main legislation with the other relevant statutes. Okay. And then, of course, by the assistant, <coughs> why we must refer to the transactional laws, okay, because when it comes to the enabling laws, okay, such as the Islamic Financial Services Act 2013, okay, it does not provide, okay, uh, the complete, uh, the complete uh, positions or the complete discussion, okay, when it comes to the, uh, when it comes to the principles of land law, okay, so this is why it is important okay to know all of these laws okay <clears throat> okay and then of course when it come to the good legal framework okay a good legal framework okay must be an effective legal framework okay so basically so far in Asia alhamdulillah is market and finance requires okay but me this market and finance in Asia basically has a good and facilitated legal framework <clears throat> and then of course uh, to we can see that okay the achievement okay the achievement of economic finance in Asia uh, basically been highlighted globally okay uh, this is show the effective okay, the effective existence of their operations uh, and and then of course it also provide okay uh, adequate legal, legal recognitions support and protections okay so right now, brother and sisters, okay, basically, um, <clears throat> basically the most important laws, okay, which is, uh, you know, the most important laws, which is which is basically nowadays can be referred to when it comes to the operation of Islamic finance, we can refer to the uh, Islamic Financial Services Act, present 13, okay, as I mentioned, the Financial Services Act, present 13, which is basically been introduced at the same time with the Islamic Financial Services Act 13 is only applicable for conventional banking system. Okay, while the Islamic Financial Services Act 13 or IFSA is applicable towards the Islamic financial institutions in Asia, which uh, which of course covers Islamic banks and takaful operators. Okay, so when come to this uh, enabling laws. Or the regulatory laws, okay. Uh, these are the four most important, okay. These are the four most important main statute, okay. The most important main statute, okay, uh, which basically give birth to the Israeli finance operations, okay. And then, of course, if you want to download, okay, if you want to download these um, laws, this suggestion, okay, you can uh, refer to this link, okay. So right now we have four main statutes. Okay, they are the Central Bank of Malaysia Act 2009. Okay, secondly, Islamic Financial Services Act 2013. Okay, 
and then we have the Financial Services Act 2013, okay, uh, and then of course Development Financial Institution Act 2002, or DAFIA, okay, in short. <clears throat> okay, so when it comes to the Central Bank of Malaysia Act 2009, let's ask look, okay, uh, in much more details, okay. So basically, uh, what we have now is the Central Bank of Malaysia Act 2009, okay. It is repeal the older version of CBMA in 1958, <clears throat> okay. And then of course, this, CB, this CBMA to the nine authorizes the continued existence okay, of the Central Bank of Malaysia, okay. And then it provides the details on the responsibility of the Central Bank of Malaysia or the BNM, <clears throat> okay, Bank of Malaysia, okay. And then basically, uh, the Central Bank of Malaysia has the role to monitor and to supervise, okay, all banks, all types of all type of banks in Malaysia, including Islamic banks, and then of course stock of operators, okay, CBMA, basically the main act. Okay, that regulates the existence of the central bank in Malaysia. Okay, and then if we go to the details of CBMA, the provision itself. Okay, uh, we'll show you about okay, the BNM administrations, its objective, okay, functions, and powers of uh, BNM. Okay, the central bank of Malaysia, and then of course the role of supervisory and monitoring in asset market and finance, and of course conventional banks. Okay, and then again, when it comes to their uh, guidelines for the ancestors, okay, usually the guidelines for economic and finance are totally different, okay, uh, are in conformity with the Sharia, okay, uh, as compared to the conventional, the guideline for conventional banks, okay. <clears throat> so, right now, okay, under the Central Bank of Nation Act 2009 or CBA 2009, okay, we can see a very clear definition. Uh, which is provided okay, for Islamic financial institution. Okay, you can find this definition under section two of CBA 2009. Okay, so when it comes to Islamic financial institution, okay, it is recognized as a financial institution uh, carrying on Islamic financial business. Okay, so what is Islamic financial business? Okay, it is basically any financial businesses in ringgit or other currency which is subject to the laws enforced by the bank, which is the central bank of nation. Okay, and again, okay, this could be mentioned here consistent with the Sharia. Okay, when it come to this, uh, the when it come to the <clears throat> when it come to the definition of financing. Okay. It is basically the giving of any advance, loan, credit, or other facility in whatever form or by whatever name called. Okay. And then again, when it comes to economic and finance, okay, uh, the financing arrangement okay, must be made okay, in accordance with the Sharia. Okay. It must be in compliance with the Sharia. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, brother and sister, it is very amazing. Okay. It is very amazing to see. Uh, in our modern uh, application of uh, banking system, we can still apply the principle of the Sharia, okay? And then not just that, it is consistent, okay? With the existing laws, okay? Uh, okay, let us continue, okay? There are important provisions under CMMA, which basically legislated to support the growth of Islamic banking and finance, okay? And then basically we can see from okay, uh, part seven of CBNA, uh, from section 51 to section 58, okay, where it discuss about the establishment and function of Sharia Advisory Council, SAC. Okay. Uh, the Sharia Advisory Council, again, it is established okay, at the level of Central Bank of Malaysia. Okay. And then uh, when it comes to the ruling of SSC, it is binding in nature. Okay. And then when mentioned about uh, the, their rulings, okay, it is basically binding upon all Islamic financial institutions. This is basically been uh, it is basically authorized based on Section fifty five CB of CBMA. Okay, and then not just that, it is continued to be mentioned that uh, in even when it come to the practices, okay, any contradictory okay, between the Sharia committee, which is appointed okay, at the level of the 
uh, of the Islamic banks with again with the ruling which is made by the Sharia Advisor Council, sorry, uh, Sharia Advisor, Advisory uh, Committee, <clears throat> okay, with the uh, which is basically um, established at the level of Central Bank of Malaysia, okay. Automatically, okay, the rulings made by the Sharia Advisory Council shall prevail. It will prevail over the resolution over the rulings which is made by the Sharia committee at the level of Islamic banks. Okay, and then again, if you go and refer to section 27 of CBMA, it emphasizes okay, on the existence of duality, okay, uh, banking system in Malaysia, okay, which is we have is banking and finance, and at the same time, we also have the conventional, okay, banking and finance, okay. Now, when it comes to Islamic Financial Service Act 2013 or IFSA, okay, basically we can see from the early establishment, okay, the early introduction of IFSA, it is basically uh, uniform, it consolidates, okay, the provisions which are applicable under Islamic Banking Act 1983, okay, and of course, Takaful Act 1984, okay, by having IFSA, both of these uh, previous laws basically been repealed, okay? Uh, and then the same line also, okay, you can see here, okay, the IFSA basically came into force in 30th June 2013, okay? Uh, and then it's basically been introduced simultaneously with eight counterparts, okay? Which is uh, Financial Services Act, Act 2013, which is enforceable towards the conventional banks, okay? So if you go through the provision, okay, inside IFSA, Okay, basically, IFSA regulates this list of activities, okay, such as Islamic money and foreign exchange market, supervision of Islamic financial institutions, okay, the payment systems, again, uh, everything must be Islamic compliance, okay, and then, okay, uh, fourth point, okay, other relevant entities, okay, IFSA also regulate activities, okay, which is, uh, applicable or practiced by other relevant entities, okay, such as Takafu operators, okay, Shana Advisory Council, Shana Committees, which is which are established, which are appointed okay, at, the level, at the level of Islamic banks. And then of course we can see also uh, the establishment of the financial ombudsman okay, for the protection of the customers. Okay. <clears throat> so of course okay, if we refer to IPSA, okay, uh, similar to the Central Bank Act 9, it also provides definitions. Okay, when it comes to Islamic banks, it is basically licensed okay, Islamic banks. Okay, it is a person licensed okay, under Section 10 to carry on Islamic banking business and include a licensed international Islamic banks. Okay, you can find this definition under Section 2 of IFSA. Okay, why banks are considered as person? Mother and sister, again, when it comes to banks, Islamic banks, they are customers, sorry, they are legal, okay, they are legal persons. Thus, this is why in the session is mentioned as person, okay, they are basically, okay, legal persons, okay, uh, okay because they are established under Company Act, okay, at the same time, also, they are recognized okay, as a legal person where they can sue. And also they can be sued, okay, under its own name, okay. So when it comes to Islamic banking business, okay, uh, IFSA refers much more detail, okay, when it comes to the activities of Islamic banking business, okay, these are the list which is counted, okay, under the understanding of Islamic banking business term, okay, they are, okay, accepting the Islamic deposit on current accounts, Deposit accounts, saving current, sorry, saving accounts or other similar accounts with or without the business of paying or collecting checks drawn by or paid in by customers. Okay. And then it also include okay, the activities, okay, the businesses, okay. So banking businesses also include accepting money under an investment account, okay, or okay, provision of finance, and of course, other such businesses okay, as prescribed. And this third under section three of Islamic Banking Financial Services Act 2030. Okay. <clears throat> so, brother and sister, 
If sa basically uh, is enforceable towards okay, full fledged Islamic finance institutions, okay, these are the lists, okay, such as we have here Islamic banks, international Islamic banks, talking about practice, okay, and then we have others, okay, other, other example there, okay, and then also if sa also is enforceable, okay, towards those conventional, okay, conventional financial institutions that basically carry on Islamic financial business, okay. This is you know, basically, uh, you know, uh, the lease, okay? the lease for this uh, conventional financial institutions, okay, um, which carry on the Islamic financial business, okay, uh, such as okay, commercial or investment banks, okay, uh, who carry carry on Islamic banking businesses, okay, In insurance brokers carry on talk of booking businesses, financial advisors carry on Islamic financial advisory businesses, okay. And of course, operators of payment system engage in Islamic financial businesses. And then, of course, it also include issuers of a designated payment instruments, which basically uh, following the Islamic principles. Okay. The most essential, the most essential thing when it comes to IFSA 2013, it also provides okay, the licensing for the Islamic financial services, okay? So here we can see that, okay? In order for certain Islamic banks to operate, okay, their Islamic banking business in Malaysia, they must obtain a permission from the Central Bank of Malaysia uh, as the main regulator. They have to obtain the license, okay? They have to obtain the permissions, okay? And then basically this permission will come in a form of license, Okay, and then this license is granted, okay, by the Ministry of Finance of Malaysia, okay, and then this kind of license basically, uh, basically need to get okay a recommendation, okay, from the Central Bank of Malaysia. <clears throat> okay, when it come to the licensing uh, for Islamic banks, my sister, okay. Uh, there are uh, several requirements, okay, and then these requirements uh, clearly stipulated, okay, uh, in IFSA, okay. First of all, uh, if someone want to operate, okay, Islamic banks in Malaysia, they have to obtain license from the Central Bank of Malaysia, okay, and then of course they must be a public company, okay, as you can see in section twenty one, okay. And then, of course, they have to maintain the minimum capital fund or surplus of asset over liabilities, okay, as being prescribed by the ministry, sorry, by the minister of finance, okay, uh, which is was of course, by the this is very important to ensure, uh, to ensure the, the the stable flow of money okay, inside inside the banks, okay, and then of course, okay, they also must pay. Uh, and authorization fee or annual fee, okay, uh, and of course processing fee, which is basically uh, need to be paid, okay, to towards the sorry to the central bank of Malaysia. This is clearly stipulated, okay, under section twenty three plus one of ISA, okay, and then of course at all time, okay, they have to carry out the Islamic banking business, okay. Uh, when they are Islamic banks or the conventional banks, okay, uh, which basically um, practicing uh, practicing the uh, Islamic banking and finance uh, accounts, okay, they have to follow IFSA, and of course, it is basically they have to follow the Sharia principles, okay. Uh, and then, of course, uh, basically, when it come to the penalty, they provide certain penalty for those uh, who basically did not, okay, did not, uh, did not do the oppression okay, in compliance with Sharia, okay, such as you can see the penalty here, an imprisonment for a term not more than eight years, okay, or a fine or exceeding twenty five million ringgit, okay, or maybe both, okay. So my question here about the ancestor, okay, here you can see, yeah, it mentioned here the imprisonment, okay. So who going to be imprisoned here, okay? 
if we say that the bank should be it should be in prison, okay, how we can basically lock down, you know, lock a bank, okay? So basically, brother and sister, when it comes to this uh, imprisonment, okay, it basically uh, directly um, include, okay, include the board of directors. Okay. <clears throat> Next, okay, we have the Finance Services Act 2013. As I mentioned, okay, it's, uh, the Finance Services Act 2019, it is applicable to the conventional banks in Malaysia. Okay. So here you can see that okay, by the implementation of Finance Services Act 2013, it also repealed the existence of the previous laws such as Banking and Financial Institution Act 1989, Exchange Control Act 1953, Insurance Act 1996. Okay? And then of course, we also have the Payment System Act 73, okay, under Section 271. Okay? Uh, FSA 2013 okay, provide regression vision for the conventional financial institutions or banks and any other matters. Okay, when it comes to the conventional banks, okay, they are basically okay, uh, okay, they can okay, they may carry out certain business. Okay, but then again, as we mentioned under section 15, 15 okay, of ISA 2013, okay. They must when when they carry out okay is it making is it making business okay they have to follow all the provisions which is relevant okay which is relevant under IPSA 2013 okay they must follow all provisions of IPSA relating to is making uh, sorry is it making business okay at the same time okay when the the conventional banks. Uh, carry out okay when the, the when the convention banks carries out okay, some banking business okay they also must follow all standard any standards notices directions conditions specification or requirement which is relevant towards Islamic banking business okay as mentioned as stipulated under IFSA okay and then and at the same time they have to fulfill their requirement their duties relating to Islamic banking business uh, just, just accordingly, okay, accordingly, just like in if some, okay, and then of course, when it comes to the prudential requirement, okay, they also have to comply, okay, with the, with the requirements as stipulated by the Central Bank of Malaysia relating to Islamic banking business, <clears throat> okay, so right now, when the conventional bank is carrying on the Islamic banking business, okay, it is most importantly to take care of the fund that they have. Okay, so these are basically the rules for funds of asset making business under the conventional bank. Okay, the fund must be funded from the clean capital fund of the conventional banks okay, and other sources of fund as specified by the Central Bank of Malaysia. This is important by the assister to avoid any existence or involvement of uh, riba, borrow, and my seed. Okay, and then just that the fund must be separated, okay, from the capital funds which the conventional bank, sorry, which the conventional banks use okay, for the operation of the conventional banking business. Okay, and then when it comes to the asset, okay, the is it making funds, okay, the asset okay, of the is it making funds, okay basically must not be used for the operation for the bank's conventional banking activities, okay? Uh, and then, of course, it is basically subject to debt or other obligation. Okay? It must not be used, okay, uh, for uh, to pay debt or other obligation by the conventional banks, okay? Uh, in relation to its conventional banking business. Okay, it is important for the sister to have this separation. Okay, why it is important to have this separation? Okay, because uh, this is how we can ensure the Shah compliance operation. Okay, for the Islamic making business, which the which the conventional banks basically participate. Okay, and then of course the board of directors. Okay, uh, basically they are required to respect the advice of Shanghai Committee in relation to Islamic banking business, 
which means that okay, the, even though the conventional banks is carrying on, uh, is carrying on the uh, Islamic banking business, okay, they have they have to appoint their own Shariah committee, okay, uh, in failure, okay, in failure to operate okay, the Islamic banking business. Uh, without any uh, sorry, without any approval from the Central Bank of Malaysia, basically these are the penalties: okay, imprisonment for a term not exceeding ten years, or a fine which is basically not exceeding fifty million ringgit, okay, or both, okay. And then again, when it comes to imprisonment, uh, they can also include the board of directors members. Okay. Now we look at the, uh, the, the, the fourth important legislation for Islamic banking finance. We have the Development Financial Institution Act 2002. Okay, so when it comes to this law again, when it comes to this act, okay, it is enforceable towards development, uh, development banks. Okay, uh, this is basically uh, okay, this is basically when it comes to development financial institutions, banks, okay, or banks, yeah. Development banks, they are basically a specialized financial institutions that are established by the government and of Malaysia as a part of overall strategy to develop and promote specific strategic sector of the economy. Okay, so for example, we have agriculture, sorry, we have agro bank, they are responsible development banks which basically um, to finance okay, uh, businesses relating to agriculture sector okay and then of course we can we can see also uh, when it comes to the sectors it also include okay agriculture small and medium enterprises smes and of course infrastructures development okay basically just similar okay, just it is basically similar to those conventional banks that carry on uh, islamic banking business okay for the development financial institutions uh, they can carry out also okay, it's a banking business, okay. But then again, they are subjected to follow the provision of Islamic Finances Services Act 2013, okay. And then, of course, uh, we can see an amendment was made in 2015 uh, under the this uh, Development Financial Institution Act 2002, which basically allow the the Development finance institution to carry out some banking business, okay, either in 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 full fledged mode or in the form of a window, okay. But then again, these practices must get approval, okay, from the central bank of Malaysia, okay. So here we can see these are the requirement or the rules for the Islamic banking business, okay, especially when the development banks want to continue with this. Uh, type of banking business. Okay, so basically, again, they must allocate a specific fund for the Islamic business operations. Okay, they must also keep all asset and abilities of Islamic banking business separate from the conventional banking operations. Okay, the Shia compliant operation must be compliant at all time, and then of course they are responsible towards to report. Yeah? they are responsible to report to the Central Bank of Malaysia in existence of any non-compliant issues or risk, okay? uh, they must also appoint Sharia uh, committees specifically for their Islamic, okay, Islamic banking business. Okay, and then uh, in any existence of non-Sharia compliance in their Islamic banking businesses or operation, they must be responsible or like they must be responsible Accordingly, okay, and then here we have uh, now. Okay, now let us go at to let us start. Okay, let us see the other existence, okay, the other relevant statute or legislation which are basically important okay, for the for the operation of is my assignment making and finance. They are also known as the transactional laws. Okay. So these are the relevant laws. They are General Investment Act 1983, Real Property Gain Tax Act 1976, STEM Act 1949, Higher Purchase Act 1967. We also have the National Land Code 1965. We have the Company Act. Sorry, we have the Company Act 2016. 
Okay, and of course, we have the anti money laundering, anti terrorism financing, and proceed of unlawful activities at zone one, which is known as AMLAT4. Okay, basically, if you want to download these laws, okay, basically, the government or nation make it very easy, eh? make it very easy, okay, make it very easy for us to, to basically to download okay, this list of uh, other relevant statutes. Okay. So basically, what you can do, you can go directly to, the, to Google, and then you can type down all the entire full name, okay? And then please, okay, uh, uh, after you type the full name of the legislation inside the Google, okay, the small box inside the, sorry, the, the box, the search box inside Google, okay? Don't forget to add PDF, okay? And then it is very easily, okay, you can find the PDF format of the entire uh, the entire legislation, okay? So by the and sisters, and let us see, okay? So basically what I prepare here is just a summary on the relevant statute or relevant legislation, basically focusing on the function of this legislation, okay? We have the General Investment Act 1983. It is to provide for the raising of funds by the government of Malaysia, okay? Which is basically can be done uh, according to the Sharia principles, okay? And then we have the Real Property Gain Tax Act 1976. Okay, this is basically um, uh, relevant towards okay uh, tax issues. Okay, it is okay. Basically, this legislation is uh, to provide for the imposition assessment and collection of tax on gains or profit that derive from disposal or acquisition of real property or shares in the real property companies. Okay. And thus, we can see that in 1987, sorry, in 1985, an, an amendment was made okay, uh, under Section 3 of this legislation. Okay, uh, when they made this amendment, okay, it basically allowed the Islamic banks, okay, allow any kind of um, institution, okay, institution which basically carried out the Islamic banking business, okay, uh, to uh, to avoid, okay, basically, it's allowed, okay, it's uh, basically prevented, okay, the double taxation on all semi-market finance transactions or documentations, okay, and then next we have STEM Act, STEM Act 1949, okay, it is basically govern the liability of banking instruments to stamp duty, okay, and then again we can see just like the Real Property Gain Tax Act 1976. The STEM, the STEM Act 1949 okay, also received an amendment okay, under Section 40A of STEM Act 1949, especially to avoid double stamp duty for Islamic financing document. Okay, so right now, based on the new position, okay, the stamp duty for the principal documents, okay, basically based on the first schedule of the of the STEM Act 1949, okay, and then of course the stamp duty for the subsidy document, okay, which is after the main document after the sorry after the master document, basically they will charge uh, RM ten ringgit, okay, for each of the documentation, okay. So basically now after the amendment, which is they did in okay, which they did in 1984, okay. Basically, the, 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 the stamping, okay, the stamp uh, fees, okay, the stamping fees for all Islamic banking documentation are the same with the conventional banking documentations. Okay. <clears throat> Next, brother and sister, we have Higher Purchase Act 1967. Okay. This is basically to protect the hires and guarantors again, uh, uh, and again, again, any, you know, any, okay. Any dealers, sorry, any dealers okay, who directly handle the transactions, okay, and then of course it is basically uh, being legislated, okay, to promote justice and to avoid oppression while engaging in commercial transactions, okay. Basically, higher purchase act 1967 is not yet uh, been harmonized, okay, to follow the principle of Sharia, okay. But then, however, when it comes to the the manner of its operations, okay. As long as the prohibited elements under the Sharia can be avoided, okay, the provision uh, of uh, higher purchase at 1967 
can be used towards the Islamic financing products. Okay, and then of course we have the National Land Code 1965. This is basically the special law that deals with the lands, matters, and issues. Okay, and then basically if you want to make okay lands as security, okay, you can use this National Land Code 1965. Okay, and then basically um. The contract itself, okay. The contract itself must be uh, must be done. Okay, must be uh, comply. It must be comply with the the Sharia principles, and then of course at the same time they also have to maintain okay, the Sharia compliant nature inside the contract. Okay, and then of course next we have the Company Act two thousand sixteen. Okay. As I mentioned, all banks in Indonesia basically are legal persons, including Islamic banks. Okay, uh, and then of course, when it comes to Islamic banks, they are public registered companies. Okay, and then of course, they have to follow okay, the provisions of Company Act, okay, 2016 in matter of corporations. Okay, and then we have also a special law which is known as anti money laundering, anti terrorism financing, and pursuit of unlawful activities. Act not 2001, okay, or in short, it is known as Amlakwa. Okay, uh, and then of course, these laws is legislated okay, to stop or prevent any activities which involve money laundering, terrorism financing, and proceed of unlawful activities. Okay, uh, and then of course, just like the Higher Purchase Act 1967, okay. Uh, as long as the provision, as long as the provision is not contradictory, okay, with the Sharia principles, thus the provisions are applicable towards the Islamic financial services institutions, which include Islamic banks and takaful operators. Okay, so this is basically one question by the assistance that you can try. Okay. As I mean, the legal landscape that exists in Malaysia that support the development of Islamic financial services last year. Okay, so for this kind of question by the ancestor, okay, again, you have to mention that you know, when it comes to the legal landscape, okay, the legal framework of Islamic finance, they are basically depends on two types, uh, two categories of laws, which are one, the enabling or the regulatory laws, and then secondly, uh, other relevant statutes or the transactional laws. Okay, then you have to mention you no know, uh, the four main statutes. Okay, and then you can select okay, a few examples. Okay, from the uh, other relevant statutes or the transactional laws. Okay, this is how you can answer these questions. Okay, so I think this is my slide. Okay. Thank you for listening. Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.